Welcome to this activity titled, It's Getting Hot in Here, The Unaddressed Problems of Vasomotor Symptoms During Menopause. My name is Dr. Nanette Santoro. I'm Professor and E. Stewart Taylor Chair of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Joining me today is Dr. Risa Kagan, Clinical Professor in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences at UCSF and Sutter East Bay Medical Foundation in Berkeley, California. So whenever we think of menopause, the most common symptom by far, and the thing that jumps to most people's minds are vasomotor symptoms or hot flashes. They're by far the most prevalent symptom. Up to 85% of women will report experiencing them. And they last longer than we uh, used to believe. We used to think that hot flashes lasted for about four to five years. Um, but more recent studies, such as the one on this slide, uh, shows that for certain women, and you can see the different groups of women, uh, hot flashes don't disappear uh, for 10 years in half of the women, especially uh, for African-American women in particular, and other ethnic groups are maybe a little less affected. Uh, there's also a certain portion of women for whom hot flashes will just never go away. It's really not well understood why that's the case, but uh, vasomotor symptoms are the most common and the most bothersome symptom reported uh, during the menopause transition and during menopause. Now, as part of this activity, we're also going to hear directly from patients uh, about their experience with vasomotor symptoms. Up first, uh, we will hear from Cindy, who's a 59-year-old woman who's been experiencing her vasomotor symptoms for five and a half years. Listen to Cindy as she shares how vasomotor symptoms have impacted her quality of life. The symptoms I've experienced with menopause have been um, more, mostly typical that everybody experiences, sleep issues. I, I had trouble sleeping and um, Falling asleep was never an issue, but staying asleep was always an issue. Um, and also, it I had hot flashes, severe hot flashes, or maybe what you would call night sweats, every night, all night, where I would wake up once an hour. And because of that, I wasn't um, functioning properly because I had proper sleep over a period of time. After five years of experiencing symptoms, the last year of having um, severe symptoms with um, sleep because of um, hot flashes in the middle of the night, I couldn't think. My, I was forgetting constantly, and not the normal kind of forget that people get when they grow, grow older, um, but it, I couldn't function properly, and that is what led me to go to the doctor. Dr. Kagan, like many other menopausal patients we see, hot flashes have negatively impacted this patient's life. Why is treatment important for women like this patient? Well, approximately 40 to 60% of women will report sleep disturbances during this menopausal transition. These hot flashes that are happening are often related to the sleep disturbance. And the prevalence of insomnia in general increases with the severity of hot flashes, and, and that has been shown in numerous studies. And the odds of experiencing depression, anxiety, dysthymia, mood disorders during this menopausal transition increases as well. Um, any woman who's been through this will tell you that this is not just like a little quiet, you know, flame inside themselves. This really can interfere with their quality of life overall. Um, VMS has been reported to have a significant impact on both health status and work productivity over and over again. And we are all in the workplace these days. And then more importantly, more recently, um, Dr. Thurston, one of our leaders in the North American Menopause Society has published extensively on the fact that VMS has been actually associated with indicators of cardiovascular disease after controlling for other relevant factors. Dr. Kagan, given all of these associations, why aren't most menopausal women's vasomotor symptoms properly addressed? There, it's, it's multifactorial. 
and um, the lack of physician training is of prime importance. There is a well-known study in 2013, a survey um, of OBGYN residents that indicated that only 20.8% of respondents were completing a residency program with actual formal menopausal education and curriculum in place. And then there was another survey that was done that said only 57% of OBGYN physicians correctly answered questions related specifically to the Women's Health Initiative data. They really just have not learned the accurate data and the follow-up studies from the WHI. Another recent survey of internal medicine, primary care, family medicine, and OBGYN residents found significant knowledge gaps about when to prescribe hormone therapy, how to prescribe hormone therapy, or even to prescribe hormone therapy. And then a really important factor is even those of us who really know the safety, efficacy, and can explain that to our patients, women are extremely confused. They have a lot of fear. They don't know who to believe. And they basically just don't know where to seek out the best help. They're very confused based on what is on the, in the media. And then since this initial publication, you know, there was years ago, a number of societies got together and said, the experts do agree. This was back in 2012, and here we are in 2021. And we still are trying to get the message out there. The North American Menopause Society, the International Menopause Society, ACOG, um, the Endocrine Society, medical societies in general, all endorse the use of hormone therapy in the appropriate patient population. For women that are healthy, that are newly menopausal, women that are within the first 10 years since that final menstrual period, and for women who are under the age of 60. And despite this, it's, the prescriptions have gone down and down and down. And from back when we trained, and we were giving hormone therapy prior to 2002, about 80% drop in prescriptions for certain. And now we have new, you know, new forms of hormone therapy. We know how to give it. We know how to protect the endometrium. And despite all of the newer um, delivery systems, the amount of prescriptions continues to decline. Next, we're going to hear from Tammy a 57-year-old woman who's been experiencing vasomotor symptoms for seven years. Listen to how she and her doctor have treated her menopausal symptoms. I wouldn't say that I necessarily had a treatment plan for menopause, unfortunately. Um, at the time that I was going through it, the most effective method uh, available, it seemed to be, was the hormone replacement therapy, which as I had stated earlier, I was not interested in pursuing. So it was kind of a <laughs> go as you go thing. Um, so as I said, the lorazepam did help with menopausal PMS symptoms and it did help some with the insomnia brought on by hot flashes, but I didn't have a formal treatment plan for how I was gonna deal with um, menopause necessarily. As you can see from Tammy's video and her comments, she didn't really enter menopause with much of a plan and um, did not have awareness of all of the treatment options that are out there. Dr. Kagan, which menopausal patients with vasomotor symptoms are eligible for hormone therapy? Well, um, we know from many guidelines now and looking at post-WHI data that women that have no absolute contraindications such as breast cancer or uterine cancer or history of blood uh, thromboembolic disease um, that, that have FDA indications. And some of the indications for certain, if you really you know, review the FDA studies and look, you look them up, are for bothersome VMS, prevention of bone loss. There are many women who have family histories and they themselves have low bone mass or what we call osteopenia. They know that already, or they've had a fracture or their mother broke their hips. They want to preserve their bone mass. Um, so that's another important indication, regardless um, if they have hot flashes or not. But many women have both together. Um, 
Another indication for hormone therapy, estrogen specifically, is uh, GSM, genital urinary syndrome of menopause. But if women have none of the other reasons to be on a systemic level of hormone therapy, we often favor using a local low-dose vaginal product. Um, and that's another whole topic in itself. There's a serum available, et cetera. Um, another indication for hormone therapy or for women who have POI, premature ovarian insufficiency, whether it be natural early menopause or whether someone had surgical menopause or chemotherapy-induced menopause, they are all important indications, especially in the woman who's symptomatic. And a healthy patient who is under 60 within the first 10 years since her last menstrual period. Thanks for that overview. So we see there's many indications. Uh, can you tell us a little more about the different types of hormone therapy? Because there really are many ways that it can be given. What's available for menopausal women with vasomotor symptoms? Um, there are many options for women, and we now even have different delivery systems and lower doses. And as you can see on this slide, um, for hot flashes specifically, VMS, hormone therapy um, options include oral conjugated estrogens, um, either alone if you don't have a uterus, or with medroxyprogesterone, or both continuous or sequential, and that could be in a combination pill. Um, we often will do that separately, even with a micronized progesterone, what many people call bioidentical, biosimilar, hormone uh, progestin, progestogen, which is progesterone. Um, there's oral estradiol, which is mimicking what our own body puts out, 17-beta estradiol, um, in varying doses as well um, with different progestogens like norgestimate. Um, we also have transdermal delivery systems, 17-beta estradiol, is available in a transdermal patch with one synthetic norethadrone acetate. Um, there's also another patch that combines it with levonorgestrel. Um, but many women would prefer to take 17-beta estradiol as a transdermal gel um, or a spray or even a patch and combine that with a separate micronized progesterone or other synthetic progestin. Um, for women who do not have a uterus, taking estrogen alone, whether it be oral conjugated um, estrogen in varying doses or even oral 17-beta estradiol also exists. We do have something very novel and different, which many may know about or not, from um, pairing an oral conjugated estrogen in a specific dose with a serum called basodoxaphene just can't take any estrogen or any serum and put them together, that's been tested. But this specific combination called a TSEC, a tissue selective estrogen complex, has been studied and approved for VMS as well as the prevention of osteoporosis. I want to point out to everybody also that we do have a systemic level ring of 17 beta estradiol in two doses. Now, it does not have a progestogen in it or a progesterone in it, um, but it is placed vaginally every three months. And this is different, and I'm going to say the brand name now because many people don't know about it. It's called Fembring, as opposed to a local vaginal product that most of us use called an S-ring. This higher dose, two doses, a 0.05 as well as a 0.1, can be used vaginally for systemic levels and works for hot flashes. But again, if you have a uterus, you need to use a progestogen, whether it be a synthetic progestin or micronized progesterone. So we have many options, and it's hard to believe, even low, low, low dose options um, for preventing bone loss, for treating hot flashes, and um, we just need to get the message out there to our colleagues and to our patients. Thanks for that comprehensive overview of all of the ways that hormonal therapy can be given. Uh, it really is amazing because most of us who are experienced feel that we, find, we can find a way. 
that will be acceptable and uh, very tolerable for most of our patients, given all those options. Our patient clip, however, showed a woman who was trying to manage her symptoms without hormone therapy, which is another scenario that we see a lot of uh, in clinical practice. What are the alternatives to hormone therapy? Well, there are many lifestyle and many over-the-counter supplements that people try, but when you really look at the data against placebo, most have a very high placebo uh, response. Um, what we have right now as an alternative, a pharmac pharmacologic alternative, is literally one and only one approved that has been vetted in a randomized controlled trial, and that is a very low dose of paroxetine, the LDNP low dose mesylate salt of paroxetine. It's a 7.5 milligram dose, which is different than the generic 10 you know, milligram dose of our current generic paroxetine. But it's not on many health plans and it's expensive and it's hard to get. So many do you try the generic. But really this LDNP paroxetine is the only that was studied in a randomized controlled trial and showed efficacy and safety, and we have a lot of information about it. But regardless, we have a lot of peer-reviewed literature studies. We learned about this from the um, breast cancer survivor world primarily because they couldn't use estrogen or women who had DVT, et cetera. Um, and we have a number of options that have been studied, published, and they do work but none of them work as well as estrogen. We have the SSRIs, as you can see on this chart, we have um, paroxetine, escitalopram, citalopram, fluoxetine. Um, I believe we also do have sertraline data. Um, there's SNRIs, venlafaxine, and desvenlafaxine data. Um, and then of course, gabapentin and pregabalin, especially for those women who need some help with sleep as well. Um, a clonidine as a patch or an oral agent, um, if a woman's blood pressure can tolerate it, is effective. Um, and then the most recent alternative pharmacologic agent that has been studied and seems to work in randomized controlled trial is oxybutanine. But then again, none of these have been approved officially, but these are the types of things that we all in practice as menopause specialists do offer our patients as alternatives to uh, hormone therapy, estrogen for a hot flat for VMS. Um, what's exciting is something new and there's a new agents in the pipeline and their more targeted, targeted approach specifically in managing um, menopausal symptoms, which include the neurokinin receptor antagonists which I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about. Thank you, and be sure to watch the next segment where we dive into the emerging new treatments for vasomotor symptoms for menopausal women.